There you go. All right, thanks. Uh, it's a distinct pleasure for me to be able to introduce to you uh, Carson Jeffries, who's going to be giving the third in a series of three seminars that we've had on this topic of flow targets in ecology. Uh, first one by uh, Dr. Sarah Yarnell, and then the second one by Dr. Eric Stein, and then uh, Dr. Jeffries will be speaking today. Um, just a few things about his background that uh, I found to be quite interesting. Uh, he's a UC Davis uh, trained ecologist, three degrees, master's degree, or bachelor's degree, and PhD from UC Davis. Um, his focus and his research has been on how physical processes um, drive and interact with ecosystem structure and function. Some of uh, his recent studies that he's been involved with is looking at um, geologically derived nutrients and how they fuel some of the spring-fed ecosystems that we have here in the Southern Cascades. Uh, he's also uh, very interested in learning uh, how Fishes use restored floodplains, for example, in the Cosumnes River, which I think we may be hearing a little bit about, and then learning how uh, food web functions in juvenile uh, salmon utilize uh, floodplains like the Yolo Bypass. And then uh, finally, uh, one of the things that the Delta uh, Stewardship Council has uh, uh, been pleased to be able to support is he's been working on some of the restoration benefits in the Northeast Delta landscape, uh, looking at monitoring and modeling uh, the links between physical processes and food webs in the McCormick-Williamson tract. Initially, I think, is baseline, but it actually kind of became more than baseline after the wet winter that we had this past uh, past few months. So, Carson, looking forward to what you have to say. All right, thank you for the introduction. Um, this, is, this is pretty fun for me. I feel that looking through the crowd, I'm at least preaching to the parish on uh, some of this, so you'll have to bear with me, but I think we'll start with some background and work our way through to where making sure that everybody here is all on the, on the same page. Um, this is also pretty fun for me thinking about, I've kind of been in this evolution in my career, and this is the first time that I'm actually giving a public talk like this where it's more of a conceptual talk. This isn't about any specific study that I've been doing. So this is, this is also kind of fun. I think this is my growing up talk. So uh, it's, I guess it's time. At some point, I'm going to have to grow up, and this is part of the process. But so anyway, so this is uh, talking about uh, California floodplains and the fish that evolved to use them. And there's going to be a lot of the hydrology and the climate. And then we'll, we'll start going into the, the actual floodplains and the fishes that use them once we move through here. But I think that it's especially hot on people's minds is thinking about floodplains after this last year. Um, we finally got a flood. You know, it's nice. I've been working on floodplains for the last probably 10 years, and the last five years have been pretty boring um, until this year. And we finally got, we finally got some fun. Um, this, is, this is the Yolo Bypass this year, and this is actually far below the peak flow. Um, and it looks like an amazing landscape out there. And thinking about what was here historically, how the fish has evolved in this landscape, and even looking at this, this is kind of where I think of going ahead. What, are we, what do we have now? What do we want to have? And so as we, we progress through this, we'll uh, hopefully answer some of those questions. But first I want to talk about what is California, how the fish evolved, what is the climate like? And so California is a diverse place. I think anybody who's been here for very long knows that. Um, we have the spring-fed portions of the Southern Cascades around Shasta and Lassen, very stable hydrology, very um, cool waters, very unique assemblage that's there. We move into the Central Valley, where's the big floodplains in the system. It's kind of where the whole Sierra Nevada come down and coalesce into the large rivers on the, on the bottoms. Um, we have the redwoods. On the, we have the Coast Range on the redwoods. You know, so we have a very fog dominated. It's very cool. It's kind of you see the coho and some of those coastal critters that are in there. Then we go to the High Sierra, has a very unique assemblage. What's interesting about the High Sierra is the fish diversity is very low. You know, from a fishing perspective, it's not that interesting, except for the very southern, Cas or southern Sierras that wasn't glaciated. And so from a native perspective, it's not very exciting. Um, the Delta, you know, the Delta is interesting. The Delta is this big mixing pot between what comes through the Central Valley and what comes in from the ocean. And it's, it's the topic of lots of conversations from particularly people in this room that I recognize. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that. And then Southern California. And so each of these regions has 
a unique assemblage of fish that have evolved to take advantage of the local hydrology, the local hydrology, and the climate. And so we're going to talk about those fishes and how they fit in, and then ultimately the fishes that are able to fit into the, the floodplain in the Central Valley and how the floodplain used to function, how the floodplain functions now, how we've changed it, and what are our paths going forward. So California has a relatively few native fish. It's, you know, you look around compared to other parts of the country and California is pretty boring on the native fish side of things. We, I think we have a lot of very unique fish, but from the diversity of them, it's not very high. Um, it's, California is relatively new on the evolutionary landscape on the West Coast. After the rise of the Sierra and the rise of the Coast Range, we've kind of been isolated for about the last, mm, let's say 20 to 70 million years, we've kind of been on our own. And, we have a pretty harsh climate. We have this Mediterranean climate with dry summers, wet winters sometimes. Um, and the fish that are here ultimately evolved under that climate regime in the diversity of geologic provinces that we have. And so there aren't a whole lot of them though. And, but the ones that we have are pretty cool. This is, this is kind of my quick selection of floodplain fish because these are the ones that we're ultimately gonna be talking about later. Um, obviously not all of them are here, but these are the ones that we see most often in, in the work that we're doing from the, the blackfish in the upper right, the suckers, the sculpins, the split tail, the chinook, uh, hitch. Those are kind of, you know, a few of my favorite fish that I see relatively frequently. But what's happened is you end up with this, you know, relatively, you know, few fish on the landscape, and then we've come in and changed things a lot. Um, the landscape is fundamentally different than it was what these fish evolved in. And that started in the 1850s with the hydraulic mining and the gold, then we came in and we levied the rivers and we put dams in. So the fish that evolved in that landscape, they, it's hard for them to recognize lots of the physical processes that are, that are happening right now. And one of the reasons why is that we've fundamentally changed the hydrology, we put dams in, so we've kind of turned that hydrology on its head. We've, we've gotten rid of some of the high flows, we've increased the low flows below most of the dams. We've changed the sediment regimes in the system, originally with too much sediment coming down from the mining, and now we put dams in and we've essentially curtailed the sediment moving through the system. And then the thing that we're talking about today are the levees, is that we've essentially, I think of a levee as just a lateral dam. And it's interesting that we have so much emphasis on the reconciliation below dams, whether it be through flow management or sediment augmentation. And then when you put a dam laterally on a river, you oftentimes don't see that same regulation managing those what I would call lateral habitats that the water would flow laterally versus when a dam longitudinally. I think we, think we have this fundamental dichotomy in how we think about those habitats, but I think from a ecosystem perspective and uh, even a geomorphic and a hydrologic perspective is that they essentially function the same way as dams. They're just cutting off that habitat to the lateral side of the river. So we've, we've kind of changed how that system works, but then we've also gone and added all these other fish. The, you know, this is the competition side of things. We've changed the habitat. Now we've created habitats that really work well with the fish that we've put in there. And so not only have we switched over the physical processes, but we've added the kind of ecological competition for fish that are more adapted to dealing with the hydrology and the environment that we've created through our management side of things. And so for lots of these reasons, we have the fish in California have been struggling. And it's part of it's because we've just changed it. If you look at the, again, this kind of long-term evolution for the fish of California is that roughly 60 or 70, 79% of the fish that we see here are endemic to our region. They're either in our neighboring states or in California and not found anywhere else in the world. Um, and that's pretty unique. And I think, again, a lot of it goes to our unique hydrology, our climate, our hydrology. And so uh, thinking about the importance of what's here, what evolved here, what processes these fish evolved in, how we've changed them, how can we go back to making these fish more stable over time? Um, there's been lots of reports lately, particularly the SOS report um, that came out of Davis and Caltrout about looking at, you know, what is the likelihood of some of these fish making it over the long term? And it's not very good. And it's for lots of those reasons that I talked about before, the habitat, the species, the management. And so with that in mind, thinking about how important and unique these fish are, those processes on how to keep them and understanding those physical processes is important. And again, we're just gonna talk about 
the floodplain side of things as we move through here. So as, as I eventually, I promise we'll get to floodplains at some point. Um, but I think this background is important to put floodplains in the context of what we're talking about in the management. So let's talk a little bit more about the native fish here. Of these 131 native species in California, most of them are pretty, half of them are big, you know, a relatively big fish, greater than 20 centimeters. You know, roughly, I think of my two hands together is 20 centimeters. So the adult stage of two of these fish, or of 50% uh, of these fish is, is relatively large. They're relatively long-lived. And so when you have long-lived fish, they're able to deal with droughts. And you think about the fish that aren't long-lived, there's one in particular, an annual fish that lives in the delta that gets a lot of attention. And, you know, if without this long-lived and high fecundity, you have a hard time dealing with these disturbances, whether it be introductions, droughts, management. Um, these larger fish that are fecund that are able to live long periods of time are able to kind of take advantage of these these good conditions that do show up regardless of how we're managing the system. I think of this last year as a great example is that we, we basically have floods every five to 10 years. And if you're a split tail say that lives eight years, odds are you're gonna get a good reproductive opportunity during that time. And so when you don't have those long lifespans is you're not able to take advantage of them. And the fish here aren't very diverse per water body. You know, we get between one to seven fish per water body in the state. If you look some places on the East Coast, you know, you're generally looking at greater than 25 species per water body. And so we have this very, I think of it, you know, we're on a very fine edge. You know, we don't have a lot of species. They've adapted to a very specific regime, and there's not a lot of room for failure in the system. And now let's go back to some of these things that I imagine everybody here is pretty familiar with, but I want to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing. California is this land of extremes if you look across the landscape. Most of the precipitation falls in the north. Most of the people live in the south, and we have this amazing plumbing system that we've developed to allow all of us to be here. Part of that is, you know, how we convey water through the system. Part of it's where we live. Part of it are our priorities. Along with just how the water, where the water falls, how the water falls in time is also really important. We have most, everybody who's lived here for more than a year knows that we have a wet period and a dry period. Um, and that we essentially have a seasonal drought every year. Every summer we have a drought where the rivers get low, they get warm, even under historic conditions, that's part of how the system worked. In addition to, you know, the kind of seasonal drought that we see, we have droughts and floods. You know, I, I, there's very little normal in here. If you actually just put a, a straight line on here over the average, very few years would actually be close to it because we're generally on one end or the other. Um, we're constantly living between flood and drought. And the fish that are here ultimately evolved to use that. And I like to say, this is the land of the hell and high water. Um, and the fish that are here, this is what they experience. This is the Kasumnas River, and this is about five weeks apart. Um, the top picture is at the end of October, and the bottom picture is at the beginning of December. So over that five-week period, you go from a perfectly dry riverbed that's dried out during the summer to flood stage. And it's, it's a pretty big flood stage. For, if you look on the top picture, that's actually me standing on that concrete thing there. Um, I don't know if everybody can see that. Those of you in the back, let me see if go this way right there. I'm about as tall as the mouse is. So you think about how much change this river experiences in such a short period of time. To be able to take advantage of it, you have to have, very, you have, to have your plan put together. You have to be able to take advantage of these. And this is a migrata migratory issue. This is a habitat availability issue. And so thinking about how these fish deal with it is one of the things that we've been pretty curious about for a while. And with these seasonal droughts and floods, along with annual droughts and floods, thinking about how this, how everything has been able to make it for the last 25 million years is that there's a couple of ways. There's physiological ways and that they're able to essentially tolerate both warm and low water conditions. And they do that through just a sheer tolerance and being able to take up um, oxygen during low oxygen in the water conditions, as well as various bioenergetics and taking advantage of conditions that have the right conditions to make it work. And that if you have enough food, you can offset some of those metabolic demands. You have high alkalinity in some of the places, particularly up by Eagle Lake and other systems, and the low dissolved oxygen. So with those, there's the physiological. So if you're stuck there, can you deal with it? The other way to deal with it is that you get out. Now, it's a behavioral adaptation. You can either move within the watershed or you can leave the watershed. And there's... 
I think of it as local migration versus anatomy. And that for the anatomy side of things, that these are the fish that are leaving freshwater and heading to the ocean where it stays wet all the time. Conditions are fairly, fairly good out there. Um, and then they're coming back to finish their life history strategies. And for, with, for the within migration and the anatomy side of things, the fish that are utilizing both the rivers and the Central Valley are really using that migration time and they're benefiting from floodplains. And floodplains were a part of their historic migratory pathway for juvenile salmonids and other fish that were spawning the floodplains is that that was the place where they were rearing and growing prior to their entry to either downstream into the delta or into the ocean. And so it was, it was a, a habitat that was historically much more available than it is now. But first, let's talk about what a floodplain is. We're, we're kind of honing down here on what I'm actually supposed to be talking about. Um, floodplains are the land along a river that is, a, that is subject to a seasonal flooding. Um, I like this picture. This is the Kasumnas River. Lots of these pictures will be from the Kasumnas River because I think it's one of these last places that actually sees. Um, I, I use natural really loosely in that it sees more natural flooding than just about anything else in the, in the Central Valley. And so you have this habitat that's adjacent to the rivers. It's flooding seasonally. but it makes a great place for people to develop because it's flat, it's right next to the rivers, which were our, really our pathways for transport historically. And so we really developed our, you know, our infrastructure around rivers. And it's a great place for fish. At times, it's a great place for cities. At times, it's a very terrible place for cities. And it's also very fertile agricultural land. And so we've gone into this from, historic flooding to saying, hey, this is the land that we want to put our, our footprint on. And so we've gone through it and we've put in dams to help mitigate some of the flows coming down so we don't have the flood flows. We put levees in, our lateral dams, to keep the floods off of those lands, and then we've developed them. And so we've gone over this, we've gone through this process of, I use reclaiming in quotes also, lots of air quotes today. Um, in reclaiming this land, through control as a part, as opposed to integrating it into what we want from the ecosystem side and the, the flood protection side. Now, and we'll talk about that at the end, but keep this in mind of what our historic paradigm has been from how we manage the system for floods versus what we can and how we can manage for floods in the future. So historically, much of the Central Valley was this big wetland. Um, this is actually a picture of the Yolo bypass that I harvested out of uh, an SFEI report. Um, but it was, it was a pretty big space. And you can imagine that roughly, that area that you see, that this is just the Sacramento Valley, was getting inundated on basically an annual level, or annual basis. And how much habitat that actually is when you think about it and how much has been lost in the system. Um, you know, we have very little remaining. You see patches of brown in there that are wetlands. Most of them are either uh, part of the reserve system or they're actually duck clubs, or really the places we're are managing for wetlands in the Central Valley anymore. And we've lost a lot of that. We've lost about 95%. We've either developed it for agriculture or urban uses. And I'm a guy who likes pictures. So this is one of my favorite images. It's actually the one on the left is uh, satellite imagery from 1851 that has been reconstructed. Um, and so, uh, I, I have to say this now because I've gone through and people have actually asked a question at the end of this talk with, uh, how did you get that imagery? Um, and so it's, uh, Matt Clark is a professor at Sonoma State and he's a geographer and he put this together as a hypothetical, what, what, would, have the, what would the landscape have looked like in the, you know, pre-development? And so, I also grabbed April 1st from this last year from, this is actually the Landsat data from NASA. And one of the things I want you to look at is, I realize that it's conceptual on the left, but I think it also really matches up next to that previously mapped data before is what the flooded Central Valley looks like. And then if you look on the one on the right is, what's amazing there is the Yolo Bypass and the Sutter Bypass are actually full during that picture and yet you can't even pick them out on the landscape. So from a landscape perspective, on the sheer area that's available, even during our wettest year on record, you still can't hardly see it from space without zooming in. Where think about it from, I know it's a reconstruction, but just bear with me, is you can 
see how much area was potentially inundated during those larger flood events. And that's probably not even a large flood event, but a you know, relatively decent year. So we've gone through, we've changed the system from a conceptualized that to what is our reality now, and we've lost a lot of that habitat. And now from fish moving down the rivers, for the majority of it, you don't have a whole lot of habitat. Um, you've lost that extension of the river. Um, I love this picture on the left. It's, uh, it doesn't look like habitat. That's the river side of things. Um, obviously, there is some other habitat, but it's, it's not what I would consider a great ecosystem. Um, you know, and obviously, there's places where we're not going on the right as well. Um, we're obviously not going to take those homes out of, we're not going to be taking people out of homes, so how can we work within uh, the framework of what we do have and what are our options for moving forward? And thinking about that, where are we at now with our floodplains? What do we have now? How do they work? And what are our options going forward? So I think of that as currently we have two floodplains. We have restored floodplains, where we've actually restored some of the processes. We've restored the hydrology. We've restored the geomorphology. We've restored the succession in the plant communities. And then we have managed floodplains. And we'll talk about each of those, starting with the restored floodplains. I, this is actually quoted. I don't need to use my air quotes here. Um, these restored floodplains are places like the Kasumnas River, and I really only have the Kasumnas here as the, as the truly restored one because it's the only place where we still have a relatively functioning hydrograph. We still have geomorphic processes going. The Kasumnas is amazing. The amount of sediment that goes through there, I'll show a picture um, at the end of the talk here about how much sediment can actually move. We don't like sediment to go places anymore. We like it to be controlled. And there's still a little bit of out of control in the Kasumnas, which is awesome. That, you know, we still need a little bit of that uncomfortable, I think, in our world. You know, I, not like Orville uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> but with our, with our flood system, I like a little bit of uncomfortable. Um, you know, then there's places where we've been reconfiguring floodplains, like on the Bear, and the Merced, where we've either set back levees and created more floodplain habitat, but it's still subject to upstream regulation for the most part. You obviously have spill events where the dams are losing control, but you fundamentally lost your geomorphic process in that you have a barrier that is stopping sediment coming down the system. And then you don't necessarily want the same, um, or you don't have in plan the same or vegetation processes where naturally recruiting and naturally distributing across the floodplain and moving around, allowing the river to move around. I think those are really important when you think about what a restored system looks like. It's not just restoring the habitat, it's restoring the processes that create and maintain that habitat over time. The other type of floodplain that we have with the managed floodplains are particularly the flood, plain, the flood bypasses. I think of Yolo and Sutter being the kind of the big ones in the valley. And they function seasonally as floodplains only when the water gets high enough to go over a crested weir, so you still lose all of those smaller flow events. You're still subject to upstream regulation as far as water being captured coming down. You don't have geomorphic processes that are happening out on these bypasses, because if you did, then they wouldn't function for the rest of their processes that they're doing, which is mainly flood conveyance and agriculture. Um, and then during the non-flood season, they're being used for lots of other things. Some of them are being used for wetlands, for either ducks or waterfowl. Some of them are being used for agriculture, but you still have to maintain flood conveyance. So they are truly a multi-use, multi-benefit system, and there are big ones in the valley that still go. So with that in mind, we've talked about the evolution of fish. We talked about, you know, kind of our hydrology, our floodplains, and let's talk about the fish that use these floodplains and why these habitats, whether they be natural or managed, are still functioning for the fish. So in the Central Valley, there's essentially two reasons for a fish to use a floodplain. They can either use it for spawning, such as the split tail that's on the top here. So the split tail actually goes out and lays its eggs on submerged vegetation during flood. So it's very tied into this flood regime. And then there are lots of other, you see, we see hitch and blackfish and lots of these other fish that go up and utilize these uh, floodplains as well. But then we also see fish like Chinook, steelhead, um, we see sturgeon, we see suckers, we see lots of other fish that are using it during their outmigration or as a rearing habitat adjacent to the river. And so there's kind of these two ways to use a floodplain. And what is it that makes them good? And why are they important for the fish? 
I think there's three things to keep in mind. There's the timing as far as when the flooding happens. There's the duration. You know, if you flood a floodplain for a day, it does you no good or very little good. You might see some benefit from it. If you, you know, you have to have enough time to get the process going to make it uh, beneficial. And then the magnitude, how much water do you actually need to inundate that floodplain? Is it something that you see a couple times a year? You know, the Kasumas River with a natural hydrograph, we oftentimes use a 1.5 year recurrence interval for our floodplain designation. The Kasumas floods every year. Even now, even during the drought, we saw floods every single year during the drought. We saw multiple floods even during the drought. And so using that recurrence interval, 1.5 years, is a little fuzzy. Um, but how, thinking about how much water it currently takes in a more managed system like the Sacramento to get water on a floodplain, it's very different. And so we'll talk about each of those things individually. So the timing of floodplain. This is, I know Sarah gave the first talk in this series, and I'm pretty sure she probably put this slide up because I know Sarah pretty well. Um, and that I've taken this slide and added some more things onto it that I, will, that I like to talk about, particularly the Central Valley critters. Um, but each of these species ultimately has a different timing for when they're using habitats, whether it be for outmigration, for spawning, for emergence in the case of the invertebrates, for recruitment for vegetation. And so depending on where you're at in California is also very, the, the space thing here. We talked about the, the various regions before, and you see that these are conceptualized hydrographs here about how the water is distributed throughout the year. You see the dark blue line is more of a rainfall system, and that's really what we think of. That's the rain when it falls. It's not being captured as snow. It's moving through the system. And that's our coast range system, really, and some of our lower systems. The Kasumnas actually follows a lot of that. Um, you have your mixed rain-snow system. There's really the northern Sierra. The Sacramento system really looks like that. And then you see your uh, snow-dominated system, which is really your southern Sierras, your San Joaquin system. It historically saw a late flood during snow melt. And so thinking about the timing of these, these are very conceptualized and averaged over time, but each individual year is what is important to the critters that are there during that year, whether they be frogs, fish, bugs, plants. Um, and thinking about what is the recurrence interval of these events that you need to have benefit to the population over time. If you're cottonwood, maybe you need a good event every 10 to 15 years. If you are a salmon, you know, you pretty much need them at, at least, you know, out of three or four years, you need two or three years being pretty decent years. You can't have some cohort mixing. But thinking about not every year is going to be the perfect year, I think, is really important when we think about how we control the system and how we manage for it. And so these different species have different life histories over time and different needs over time as well. And I think on the consumers, we've, we've seen this. This is actually during uh, 2012 through 2016 our sampling that we've been doing out there. And on the top graph is our split tail catch. And I put the gray box in there, and that, that's roughly what we consider our split tail window, which is from about February 1st through April is when we see the adults coming in and spawning. We don't really see them, or it's not through April through March. Um, in the consumers, we don't really see adults show up after March. And so their window of floodplain need is kind of during there. If you go down and look for juvenile Chinook salmon, that window has moved much farther in the system. And so as far as the timing goes, for, for split tail it's one, for the salmon and the Kasumnus it's another. You'll notice that there are some of the black dots in the Kasumnus or in the Chinook on the bottom that are outside of that window, and those are all non-natal rearing. So those are fish that have come into the Kasumnus from other rivers, and they're using that habitat then. I think it's somewhat of a product of the way that the Kasumnus works and that it has a late adult run because it's dependent on flows before it has enough water for adults to go up. And so when we put windows on things, we oftentimes, the timing window that we put that fish use, each watershed is a little different depending on like that last hydrograph that I talked about, but then it's also species dependent. And thinking about that when, you know, the Kasumnus is our natural system, but this is our rare, I like to think this is our living laboratory. This is where we learn about process that we then take to other places that we ultimately turn the knobs on and manage. And that thinking about these species each have a different time frame that they need and how we get enough of those in a given amount of frequency that we maintain populations over time is really important. So that's the timing side of things. 
For duration, this is a, con obviously this is conceptual. If this were real data, I'd like give a high five and walk out of here right now. Um, and so uh, this, is, uh, this is how we think that the floodplain food web works. You have flooding, we see, I put chlorophyll A, you can put productivity, primary production um, there, and it takes about a week before you start even getting that going from the peak of the flood. And then you have your secondary production. This is your zooplankton, your invertebrates, all those critters that are out there. Then start grazing down those lower, those primary producers. And then you have your fish benefits. So if you're managing for fish, this is when we get into how long you have to have water on these habitats before you start to see benefit. And it's really complicated. You know, of course, it's ecology. Nothing is simple. Um, I'd be a hydrologist if I wanted things to fit the boxes really well. Um, I like to wave my hands because I can have low R squared and be okay with it. Um, and so uh, this is a conceptual of how this process works and that you need to have the water out there. And I always like to start for those of you online by using my hands, um, is if you think about a levee with, or a river within a levee, is this is more or less the channel it's going to. This is your solar panel that that water is moving through the levee. It has a relatively low residence time. And then when you spread it out on a floodplain, if you drive across the Yolo Bypass and drive across the Sacramento River during flood, you get an idea of what that big solar panel is and how you fundamentally change the system. And not only did you make that solar panel really big, but you slowed it down and created some more diversity in it. And so you've increased the residence time for this process to happen. You increase the residence time for that algae in the water to develop. You've increased the water substrate interaction, so you have that de decomp and you have that detrital food web that's going. All of that funnels into that zooplankton population, and then ultimately that is what drives your fish production out there and how quickly they're growing. And I love this picture, um, really the one on the bottom. The one on the top is just primary production. Um, this is algae out there. But if you look at the bottom side here, on the bottom graph here, is these are three samples from the Yolo Bypass, the Toad Drain, and the Sacramento River on the same day. And there are about 250,000 inverts per meter on the one on the left, and there are about 1,300 in the one on the right. And so you think about how much production difference in those two habitats and what you get when you spread that water out, slow it down, is you end up getting this, what I like to call the zoop soup. You know, this is where your production is coming from. This is where the food resources are coming from. And this is how you get the differences between the river and the floodplain habitats. So that's duration. Magnitude, changing flows. We have, as we talked about earlier, we have fundamentally changed the system. We are no longer in what was here before. This is a system that we now manage. Um, the, these are the same discharge data looked at two different ways, and I'll talk about them, why that's important. If you look at the one on the left, on the lower left, you can see that we've lost the big peaks. This is the Sacramento River at Red Bluff, by the way. We've lost the big peaks that have come out of the system after the closure of Jasta Dam. And so we've lost those really large flood events. Obviously, we can't have that happening because we live in the floodplain. So seeing 250,000 CFS at Red Bluff seems amazing. You know, it's, it's something that happened relatively frequently before the closure of Shasta Dam. And then, we've, so we've, we've, we've shrunk our peak flows coming down. We don't have a recession anymore. We've, we've curtailed the recession on there. But the other thing that's interesting is that if you look at the, on the graph of the right, is our summer flows are now higher. And this goes back to more of the invasive species. We've kind of homogenized the system. We've gotten rid of the flood and drought, and we've kind of knocked down the floods, and we've kind of increased the drought below the major reservoirs in the system. And so we've fundamentally altered the habitats that were here before. Um, and I just couldn't help but myself put this statistic in here as well, is that the average daily flows are actually higher post Shasta. So this is really water coming in from the Trinity. But I just think that that's interesting is that if you look at this, it's like, wait, we don't have as much water coming down because we've gotten rid of the floods. But the mean daily flow is actually still higher if you incorporate the Trinity water coming over. I think it just highlights how different the system is now than it was before and how these fish that evolved to the hell in high water, now we just kind of have wonder bread. You know, it's kind of boring bread. We still have a little, like I said, we still have a little bit of 
of uncomfortability. But from the fish perspective, we don't have nearly the uncomfortability that we had that allowed these fish to succeed in a, in a diverse and changing on a relatively short scale. So talking about magnitude and runoff and precipitation, um, I, was, I was getting ready for this. I, I ended up going down this rabbit hole for the next three slides, so excuse me if it's too far off tangent, but I couldn't help myself. So here we are. This is the Northern Sierra Aid Station Index. I'm sure anybody who's interested in California water spent oh, maybe not every day like I did looking at this, but um, thinking about it. And then if you look at the Southern Sierra, it was actually just about average with AB3, which is the green line there. Um, it, was, it was about the same. So Northern Sierra, we had our wettest year on record. Southern Sierra, we're roughly tied for our wettest year on record. And then I went back and I showed this earlier. And this is the runoff slide generated by the USGS. And look at the last year there, and that's, 20, that's this last water year, as of, updated as of this week. And it doesn't look that special. So thinking about what we saw from a precipitation standpoint and what we're seeing through actual downstream runoff is very different. And a lot of that is the antecedent conditions from having so much capacity in the reservoirs to capture the flow coming through the system and also the, the groundwater tables being reduced, so there's a lot of it. But it's amazing looking at the last 100 years is here we have our wettest year on record, and yet it looks, you know, it's okay from the flood perspective, which is great if you're a manager for flood control, but not great if you're a fish. Um, and thinking about what it looks like even now, looking at 83, which is kind of our, has been our year of record for flow data, and then looking at this year, Again, we lost that spring recession, that flood that really attenuated out through the, through the year. And I think that it's just important to think about in that we ultimately control the system now. This is a heavily managed system, and we're not going back. We're not going back to what was here before when, you know, the 1851 satellite imagery, we're not going back to that. Um, I picked this map up also, and that this was a map from the early um, 1850s. And it's interesting thinking about what that looks like now versus what it looked like then. And how do we decide what we want to be in the system? You know, that's ultimately what this is going, going to, is that this is a heavily managed system. Here we have our wettest year on record precip-wise, but we're far from our wettest system, or our, our wettest year outflow-wise. And so with that in mind, how do we reconcile what we want? And I think that this is, I just did an interview the other day where there was the future of salmon. What are the future of salmon in California? And my answer was pretty simple. It's like, well, whatever we decide. Because we're ultimately turning knobs in the system and we're managing the floodways. Um, you know, we've gone through a century of trying to control the system within its, within its levees and behind the reservoirs and is there, are there opportunities for reconciling both of these, putting them on the same landscape, whether it be through releases of water from reservoirs, is it through pro, or restoration of process, not just habitat, but process. You know, you can restore habitat, and if you don't restore the process that maintains it and makes it useful, then it's not necessarily beneficial. And it's not just any one thing. Um, you know, we can't, the consumeness is kind of our little postage stamp that we get to learn about these, but we're not going back to everything looking like the consumeness. I think that, you know, lots of it is going to be looking more like the bypasses in the system where it's a multi-benefit, it's a flood control system that has ecosystem benefit on top of it. And it's a, it's a mix, it's a diversity of those things. Um, when I was talking about sediment below, or earlier in the talk, the picture on the bottom left is the consumeness this year. In that little section right there, there was about 800 cubic meters of sediment that were deposited. That's amazing. What other system when we let it go crazy like that? We just don't let things go crazy like that, and that's fine. But we have to realize that that's one process for floodplain, and then you have the one on the right, which is the Yolo Bypass this year, and that's another process. And that differentiating them and understanding that is really important for what we want in the system. And so, I think of this as the string of, string of pearls. I stole this from the Chesapeake Bay group, this idea. But right now, I look at the system, and there's two big pearls on it. There's the bypasses as far as just sheer acreages of habitat that are available to migrating fish from Redding down to the, 
Um, I should have probably put more, more pearls a little farther down. But um, the idea, though, is that you know, ultimately you need to have more pearls on this string and that it's not just having two big pearls on the bottom isn't going to do it. And especially since these two big pearls are on the side of the river and not necessarily accessible all the time, um, you know, we're, we're making progress, I think, towards making that happen more frequently, such as Fremont Weir modifications. But the idea is that if you have this string, fish are moving from top to bottom, you want to connect these habitats and have them be not just good habitats at the bottom or good habitats at the top, but having them space enough that they're inundated frequently enough that you don't have these death zones. I think of, you know, particularly this, the stretch between Calusa and the Feather River is not a great place to be a juvenile salmon. And are there ways that you can mitigate that? I think there are. Um, you can see I actually did put one pearl in there. There's the Borg Bend restoration that went down this last, I guess, almost two years ago. Um, but the idea is that you need more of those pearls. And you can have a lot of pearls, and they can be small, and that's okay, as long as they're connected and you ultimately increase that habitat and its functions over time. So I tried to, I tried to end on a happy note in that, you know, we're not all doomed. We're not, we aren't going back, but I think that there is a lot of opportunity to go forward within the system that we have and that it's ultimately us that decides whether we want to have, what we want for our future. Um, we, we, as much as we lose control occasionally, we ultimately control the system. And I think that's, that's our job is to decide how we do want to control it. And so with that, I'll uh, open it up for questions. Questions? Questions from the audience? Yeah, thank you. Um, in places where there hasn't been, you know, floodplain in a very long time or, uh, you know, several decades, how do we encourage the fish to actually use those? I mean, if we're constructing new wetlands or uh, floodplains, uh, do they just have to kind of wander into them? Is there some kind of signal that can be given to encourage them to, you know, go that way where there's favorable habitat or are we just kind of at the mercy of them stumbling upon these constructed facilities? No, I, I think that's a good question. You know, unlike the waterfowl people, fish don't have wings. Um, and so they're not necessarily deciding as much. It has to be connected. I you know, if you have connected habitats that are adjacent to the river, lots of the fish are migrating up the sides of rivers or down the sides of rivers, and you know the likelihood of them running into those habitats is higher when you're in there. And the idea is you're not going to get all the fish going by and utilizing one of those habitats. You know the idea is that you have enough of them throughout the system that they're not reliant on hitting one of those on the way down. But if you have several of them throughout the system and you have enough flow to get out there, then, then they have the opportunities to get out there. Uh, you mentioned the Bullock Bend site and uh, that was constructed last year. It's on a big bend in the Sacramento River. And as soon as it flooded, even without any vegetation in it, uh, we caught listed some on it and, and steelhead in there. So they, as long as it's connected, when it floods, they, they, they hit it. Thank you. I haven't, I haven't seen the update from that. Um, and that's one of the things that we've seen before is that it doesn't take, as long as there's slow water, the fish are going to use it on the side of the river. Um, it's really just getting out of that channel, you know, that high residence channel. And when you actually, you know, they're, I hate to say this so simply, but, you know, small fish are essentially particles in a big, big channelized river. You know, there is some, there is some ability to move around, but it's not, you know, you can imagine being a, two-inch fry coming down, um, when you end up on a floodplain, you actually then have the opportunity and to choose where you're going a little more. But we've seen that everywhere. As soon as you open something up and water's flowing out there, that we'll see the fish out there as well. I think you have to... Can you give some timing on the, for um, the floodplains? If, right, if I remember right, it was five to seven days for phytoplankton maybe 10, 14 for zooplankton. When do the midges appear? Um, that's a great question. So one of the things that we do have, uh, we've done some work in Ted Summers' work group at, and Gina have at DWR 
where we've actually rehydrated blocks of sediment, and it's about two weeks. It's about, they start showing up in about two weeks, because they're in a state of diapause, and you'll start seeing them show up as the larval stage, and then they'll come out as, as adults. So they're always there. Um, most of them are in a resting stage in the soil waiting to be rehydrated. Does that answer your question? Plus or minus. It depends on how warm it is and what conditions are actually like, but yeah. I might have seen a question online. I'm going to check real quick. Does anybody have a question in the meantime? So I'm interested in intermittent rivers, and if you map intermittent rivers in California, you'll find that about two-thirds of the river network are intermittent. How many of these 131 native fish species are dependent on intermittency for their life history? I don't think I have a great answer for that. Um, I don't know. I think that you see lots of, you know, we've, we've changed it and, and homogenized it, so we don't have intermittency as much anymore, I think. I think we've lost a lot of it. Um, I don't know how many of them are dependent upon it. I think that by reducing the intermittency, we've reduced their competitive advantage. And part of that has been through cutting off migration, but also changing species assemblages where they're not as advantageous. Um, I know that's a very unsatisfying answer. Sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, I haven't really thought about it, and I would, I would have to put my mind to that one for, before I give you a really good answer. So we had a quick question about that intro picture that you showed um, of the, the flooding of the bypass, and it looked like there might have been fences on there. Oh. Um, were those fences, and are they impeding fish passage? Should I just go back so everybody can see it? Yeah, I might have to move. Oh. Sorry. So this is a picture of the Yola Bypass during flood this year. It's looking south. The first bridge that you see is I-5, and the bridge in the distance is I-80 to orient everybody. And those are not fences, those are rice checks. Um, so those are the rice checks that are in the field. Most of this is under rice during the summertime. And the, the kind of beauty of rice is that it's ultimately, it's graded to drain. And so as the water comes out, the fish ultimately drain out with it. And so this is not an impediment for fish of, of any kind. Really. The only fish that we see stranded out here are the non-native fish, which is pretty fine. I think of this as a big uh, a positive, is the, is the positive of floodplains is that as this gets to get too hot for the native fish, is it's getting just right for the southeast U.S. and southern southeast Asian fish, like the carp and the bass and the sunfish. And we kind of see a massacre of them out there. It is the, uh, the pelicans, the herons, the egrets are out there by the thousands eating all of these fish that get stranded out there. So I actually, that's one of the things that I think makes these systems function is their ephemeral nature is that they do dry out every year and they don't have non-native species that are year-round residents that are able to take advantage of them as quickly as the, as the native fish are during the winter time. Hi, Carson. Great Hi, talk. Um, one question, thinking about residence time and then also getting projects that get through permitting. Um, we see sometimes we want to create places that hold water on it, and yet some of the agencies are like, don't create places that will strand fish. Don't create topography that will pond areas. So, But if you make it drain really nicely, then it doesn't hold water for this long period to get good and juicy. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you for teeing that up. Um, this is one of my favorite topics. Um, and I know Ramona is familiar with this, but one of the, the first um, restoration out of the Kasumnus actually didn't have draining topography. So the, the main sites on the Kasumnus restoration where the levees were breached, there was actually there were ponds dug on the floodplain, and I think it was for waterfowl was the reason that you could hold water long enough for waterfowl. Um, and it was before the fish agencies were requiring drainage off. Um, we've been monitoring it for almost 10 years now, and we almost never see native fish stranded on those, um, 
in those ponds. And you see it as soon as the hydrograph turns over for the spring recession, is you see this mass exodus of native fish. And obviously you're not getting all of them. Um, I think that would be crazy to think that you don't have um, any native fish that get stuck out there. You do get larval fish, you do get some bigger fish, but you get the vast majority of them out. And having the benefits of having that residence time far outweigh losing a few fish. Um, you know, from a regulatory agency standpoint, I get what their point is like, you can't have any winter run get stranded out here because we have so few left. But I think that the benefits so far outweigh the, the negatives of losing a few individuals. And that's what the landscape looked like over time. And that's what these fish have evolved to take advantage of. And that's, we've seen that for years on the Kasumnas in that as soon as that hydrograph turns over and gets close, we see this just mass exodus of fish. And then as soon as it disconnects, if you throw a net out there, it is just, it is carp fill. Um, you know, we've caught upwards of 80,000 juvenile carp in a net at a time. And it's disgusting. I mean, in a lot of ways, it is disgusting. And then there'll be 300 pelicans just sitting there just like, oh my God, this is gonna be so great. Um, but it's, uh, it's again, you know, these fish have evolved to take advantage. And I think that's one thing in the Kasumnas, but I think it's a different story in a more regulated river where you have a harder recession. And I think that has to be part of the system is that if you have a hard recession that doesn't necessarily decline at a slow enough rate, then you might not give those cues for those fish to get out of there enough and that you have to have a long enough draining and tail on that to get them off. And I think that that's really important to think about is, it's again that process. It's sort of restoring the process along with the habitat is where you see the benefits for these fish. What are the cues? What are the specific cues that the fish are responding to that they, they know how to move in and out so quickly or so effectively? I, I think it's connected by a lot. I think you run into this, this multiple parameter problem in that temperature is ultimately related to flow and by day of year. I mean, I think that you run in, it's hard to tease any one of those out of the system. I guess you could, if you had, if you had an ultimate experimental facility that you could all that you could play with those things, then you could. But you know, you have this. Everything is related at that time of year, and I don't think you can take out any one of them. We haven't seen it that we could take them out at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you.